learn by doing and have fun doing it. It's bright up here. I would say that's kind of my mantra for a lot of things and I'm going to talk about it in terms of creativity today of course and I really mean it. I mean this um, this is exactly what's kept me in the business for longer than, well okay, do some mental math here. If you were born between 1977 and yesterday, then I have been a graphic designer for longer than, well since you were in kindergarten or before. So, a real long time. And I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, wait a minute, that's probably 32 years and you're wondering, so this guy's only three years, started when he was three years old and yeah, you can think that if you want to. So, I've been doing this for a long time and believe it or not, I still wake up looking forward to work every day I have to work. Sure, I'd rather do other things but um, I don't dread work. I love what I do for a living, doing it for 32 years and this is my little secret. I'm going to do a quick three part introduction to the material and then we'll get to the good stuff which is the projects that I want to talk about. So a quick what, why and how about this presentation. What it is, what is it? What am I talking about here? These are things you can do to keep your creative work fun and you'll hear me say the word fun a lot today so forgive me for sounding repetitive but it, I don't mean it in a glib way or a throwaway way, it's really important and I'll explain why. I mean I think we all know why fun is important. Uh, it's about keeping your stuff up to date and evolving. Important also. Everything comes out of the book that Scott just mentioned, D30, D, D is in designers, 30 is in the number of projects that are in here. And I have selected my seven favorite projects from a book that's already my 30 favorite projects. So you're going to be hearing about the cream of the cream of the crop, the stuff I really want to talk about and the stuff I really like doing. And all this is like real life tested. This is what I actually do for um, for fun and for learning. And yeah, I'll be doing a book signing at 1.30. Luckily Stefan Muma won't be, th oh wait a minute, you are signing, Stefan. <laughs> Ignore this guy, you know. Anyway, we'll be doing dueling book signings at 1.30. Please come see us, make us look popular. Our bosses are here, so we would appreciate it. Even if you don't buy a book, just wave hi to us. Can you believe my mom says I'm not photogenic? <laughs> the why. It's because these things are fun. Like simple as this, uh, you know, we do things that are fun even if they're bad for us and I'm talking about stuff that's good for us. So the fact that it's fun means we're likely to keep doing it and you keep doing creative stuff and obviously you get better at it and you get better at it, you become a better designer and you keep your job and you keep having fun at your job and next thing you know 32 years have gone by, your whole career has gone by and you're still happy and it's that fun component. Also because another reason why we're going to be talking about these things, they keep us, they allow us, I'm sorry, to experience and learn the things we want to experience and learn. When you're on the job, who gets to decide what you do? It's usually your client, your boss, your account manager, your project manager. So this is stuff that we go, oh, I want to learn something about video. I'm going to play around with that and learn some things and that's going to come up here in a little bit. Now how do most of these projects work? What defines them? They're mostly done on our own time. Uh, once again, you know, when you're at work, you can't really make the calls on what you're doing. So yeah, I'm afraid like here's yet another thing to slot into your life but um, the good news is, the projects that I'm talking about here, a lot of them you can do in 15 or 20 minutes. I'd say the longest and the most complicated projects in the book are neither long nor complicated. You might spend three hours on them and you would want to once you see what they are and that three hours could be spread out over a few days. So tiny spaces of time are adequate for these projects. They're often analog, meaning non-digital. Um, I love digital media. I love it so much. I love the undo command. I love Photoshop layers. I was born at the right time. Um, I'm a little clumsy with my hand as far as drawing goes so you know Illustrator is my friend. But I do it all day long. So what I like to do is mix things up after hours. Paint brushes, paper, I see some people nodding. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, paper mache. We're going to talk about a lot of this stuff only because it's different from what I do at work. And yeah, Trust me and I'm sure a lot of you know this, the stuff you do that's analog outside of work just for fun, it all comes back to your illustrator files later on and things you do for 
for work, usually digitally. And lastly, another, you know, how, how you're going to do all this is you'll always make use of exactly the skills and the tools that you possess right now. No excuses. Say, I, I'll keep using the example of video because it's a good thread that, and I think a lot of us are interested in learning more about video and maybe adding it to our repertoire. Um, say you don't have a video camera, you don't have a DSLR, you don't have uh, anything that shoots good video. Well, you got a cell phone camera, or, and surely you've got a friend with a pocket camera that shoots video. More than enough to make the kind of projects that I'll be talking about, and there's tons of free and cheap editing software. Don't ever let yourself do that thing like where you make excuses, like I'm not, I don't want to do this project because I don't have the latest video camera. Who cares? I really believe in the power of restriction. Like you, you narrow down the amount of leeway I have in a project and what's left? Creativity, you know, that's it. So use whatever you got and if you're bad at something, if you see a project up here that I'm talking about and you're like, well, I can't do that, I don't know how to do that, who cares? You know, no one's going to be good at anything the first time they try it. So no excuses is all I'm saying. seven project ideas. All right. Each of these has been really significant for me. I'm actually kind of excited right now. I'm going to talk about these with my, my peeps. Um, this is good stuff. All these are designed to make it better at what you do for work. They're all designed to keep you with this idea, okay, this is kind of a theme that's overall, it's overarching and it'll be interwoven. I became a designer because I like making stuff. I like doing art. I like, I like making stuff. It's a, it's a broad statement, but, you know, design's a pretty broad discipline and um, a lot of you are the same way. I doubt many people here became designers because you like doing spreadsheets and the accounting at the end, you know, billing cycles. You know, we like making stuff and we end up having to do these other things too. But the more I can do to remind me why I got in the field, the better. Because then I keep associating my work with the fun that I have, the, the enjoyment that I have from making stuff. Simple as that. Project number one create swirling swirls. Um, some of you might even have a copy of this book, so a lot of this stuff will be sort of familiar, but I'm not, and the book goes into a lot more depth than I'm able to here, but at the same time, you know, I'm, here I am talking to you, talking to my people, and I can throw in some anecdotes that I think will be um, useful in a different way. So what is this project? I'll tell you that in a minute, but why are we going to do it? What's in it for you? This is a good way, I think it's a great way to connect your eyes and your brain with your hands. You know, I eye, brain, hand, pencil, pen, paper. It's just something, you know, we can all do that, but it's under-exercised these days. I, I love drawing an illustrator. I love those little handles. I like how you can just throw something onto the screen, pull out a few handles, and next thing you know, they have a beautiful arc, a beautiful design. Um, but I also like to do it with my hand. I used to use a lot of tracing paper back in the early Mac days, and yeah, I was a designer before the Macintosh. So, uh, it was a lot of tracing paper. You do a quick sketch, you get a sheet of tracing paper, you improve your drawing. Then the Mac came along, it's like, screw tracing paper, I'm done with that. I'll just do layers in Illustrator or Photoshop. And um, then about five years ago, I started using tracing paper again. And man, does it speed things up. You know, there's just no, you know, I can't like give you a scientific study. I can't cite anything like that. But I know from personal experience, and many of you would agree, that if you're doing a sketch of an idea by hand, and you can sketch, and this, this is just a project to hook up those synapses for you a little bit. Um, things go really fast. They go much more naturally. You know, when you work with a computer, as wonderful as it is, you're working within the computer's what it offers you in the way of tools. Pencil on paper is just you and your brain and your hand sketching ideas. So I love it. And this is a great way that I can get my hands and my eyes a little bit of exercise. It builds real-time skills of evaluation. Um, that's just a really minor point, but I think it's important. When you're drawing by hand, in this exercise, we'll be drawing like an S-shaped swirl. Um, so you you're, you're hear this conversation going on, like bigger, bigger, smaller, more graceful, down, and up, and done. And you're evaluating what you do in real time. That looks good. That looks bad. Let's fix this. It's just something you don't do too much on the computer. On the computer, you always know if something looks terrible, you can fix it later. Um, I have personally discovered there's no undo command with my pencil or my pen or my paintbrushes. It's, you know, stuff gets real when you're drawing on paper. And I like that. And it leaves you with ready to use decorative graphics. And, you know, all these projects leave you with take home, put up on your wall, put up in your cubicle, bonus material, which I love. Here's how this one works. Grab a cheap piece of paper, save your good paper for later. And I suggest in the book, like, 
um, fold a piece of letter sized paper into quarters and work within each panel of the paper. Uh, it's just a little psychological twick, trick. You know, you're drawing a, a swirling design in one panel, you don't like it, just move to the next panel, big deal. Flip the piece of paper and you got four more panels. Also these designs can be kind of absorbing and if you want to fill up a whole sheet of typing paper, you could be at it for a while, which is not a bad thing but I'm just suggesting keep things manageable at the start. So, you look at this piece of paper and you, you do this thing where you just envision what would a, S, a graceful S shaped swirl look like on the paper? This is not complicated stuff, I know I'm, I'm just kind of guiding you through the way I do this project. Draw your swirl. Um, do your best swirl that you can. This is kind of like the spine of all the swirls you're going to be drawn in a minute. Draw a swirl and look at it and go okay I like that, I don't like it. And if you like it, move forward and go where would the next swirl be? You know, again this is not complicated. Uh, but as you're working, you're, you're drawing a swirl, you're adding another swirl, any more swirls, and you're thinking like a designer. You are totally exercising all these super good design things. Balance, flow, variety. I thought of like what are the, the four main things I'm thinking when I'm drawing something as simple as this. I'm thinking balance throughout the panel, the flow of things which is a real left brain sort of thing. I wanted a little bit of variety with my swirls. I don't want them to all be carbon copies unless I'm going after something that's all carbon copies on purpose. And a general look at consistency, super important. If you are a clumsy drawer, just do the whole thing clumsy, who cares? You know it's amazing how charming, for lack of a better word, or that's a pretty good word really, um, an illustration can be when it's just uh, openly clumsy. So do, use whatever skills you got, draw your swirls. If you have a magnificently talented drawing hand, then you know, go for it, go for perfection. If you look close at my swirls, you'll notice that they're actually doubled up lines. This is just a little gimmick of mine because my drawing skills, which I'll say a million times today, aren't superb. So when I draw the first swirl, I'm always dissatisfied with a little bit of the arc here, a little bit of a detail there. So I, as soon as I'm done with one swirl, I don't even lift up my pen, I just start going backwards and retrace the thing and I'll broaden a section that was flat and try to improve the look. Plus, it gives a kind of a casual look. So it's like, oh, if it's not perfect, well, I meant it that way. You know, it, it just has that kind of flavor. Just a suggestion, you can do that and you can do, you can do this any way you want, of course. This is how I do it. Draw more swirls. Fill up your page. You know, and then when you get to a certain point, you might fill in some of the negative spaces with little flowery designs or something. This is just the bare bones idea of a doodling habit that I have and you'll find these little swirling designs all over the place for me. There was a few years ago where I consciously thought, you know, I want to learn how to do ornamental shapes. Um, just from the top of my head. So that's when I started doing these and first thing I realized was that I was pretty bad at them and then I got better at them and now it's just a habit I do for fun and it really improves my drawing skills in all ways because my brain is so much more hooked up with my hand now. So I love that exercise. You can do it anywhere. Make your swirls squares. I love drawing on napkins uh, with um, Pilot Precise V5 Extra 5 pen, one of my favorites. Um, you draw really light because you'll rip the napkin otherwise and every time you stop, ink blots out so you go draw, blot, draw, blot, draw, blot. You can kind of see the effect. I think it's kind of cool. And you can throw that into Photoshop, remove the backdrop and just have the, the blotty sort of lines or you can leave the backdrop in there. You can color these things. There's my screensaver. And just a quick aside, you know when you're photographing, when you, if you draw a swirly panel that you want to throw into your computer, Scanning it works of course, but what I like to do is take my camera and shoot from a low angle, shallow depth of field so it kind of blurs and it gets a perspective sort of look. Um, I don't use my scanner too much. Swirling swirls. So, let's move on to the next one. This one's digital. Take pictures that are so wrong they're right. I just love this thing. I'm, I take a lot of pictures for my books as some of you might know and um, I've never been to photography school and I'm kind of glad because I kind of like pictures that are technically wrong anyway. And here's an exercise that just like glorifies the idea of just going for it with your camera. When I've done online classes based around the book, this, this project seems to really excite a lot of people because the feedback I get is like, you know, they feel like they're given permission to take pictures the, the way they've been wanting to take them anyway. It's like, oh, so Ron can be right. Well, of course it can. I mean, you'll know it when you see it. And I'll, give you examples in a minute. It's a great and low pressure way to learn about your digital camera. I mean if you're trying to take pictures that are wrong, like how can you really go wrong? If you accidentally shoot a picture that's like 
brilliantly perfect, well, just keep it, you know, use it for something else. But for this project, you really can't go wrong. It's low pressure, good, excellent project for figuring out all the buttons on your camera. Put it in manual mode and just start playing around with the buttons. We'll exercise your eye for composition. So, I throw that in there because it's true that we're not necessarily card carrying photographers and we're not expected to take perfect photographs on this exercise, but we're designers and I'm not letting us off the hook here. I don't let myself off the hook here. You're framing a photograph and you're thinking balance, flow, variety, um, unequal spaces, visual hierarchy, and maybe most of all, interesting content. So yeah, work those muscles. Um, be a designer, don't just point your camera and click it necessarily, but compose that thing and then take a terrible picture of it. It will create a cache of contemporary images. Let me just show you examples and you know what I'm talking about. For example, here's a photo with three strikes against it right off the bat. It's overexposed and it's also underexposed. Um, not an easy thing to do and it's blurred. So there are several things wrong with this photograph but you know, and this is maybe just me and I'm sure I'm, I share this thought with a lot of people, if I'm gonna put a picture of bicycle riders up in my house, it's gonna be like this. It's not gonna be like a sports illustrated shot. You know, even those, ha those have their place. I like pictures like this, so I like taking pictures like this. And in terms of it being contemporary and a viable type of photograph for media, I think we all know this and um, I could, I can picture this, so to speak, being used in a magazine article, maybe an essay, maybe it's titled Racing into Darkness, uh, uh, Athletes Journey into Drug Abuse or something like that. <laughs> so, perfect, done. And the, the Sports Illustrated photograph just wouldn't work for that essay. We all get jobs like that, right? A lot of you have heard of lens baby lenses. Um, if you haven't, lensbaby.com. Mostly made out of plastic, movable little lenses you put on your fancy DSLR and they take terrible pictures on purpose. They're, they can take terrible pictures and, but to me they're beautiful in their own way. So I have a lot of ongoing collections going on with my camera. It kind of keeps me with my eyes wide open looking for subject matter all the time and um, one of them is gas guzzling cars from about 1965 to about 1975, give or take a couple of years. If I see one around town, I kind of bookmark it in my head and within a week or so I'll throw my digital camera, which I don't normally carry with me because it's too big, and a lens baby and I'll go take a picture of it. So all the pictures of these cars that I have are done in this style, which to me looks way more like a memory or a thought than a straight up photograph and that's what I'm, that's the way I want to do it. I'm in charge of this series I'm doing so that's the way I'm going to do it and I like them. I like how the wheels just kind of disappear because I'm purposely using camera settings that um, underexpose and I throw it into Photoshop and blow out the highlights and get a shot like this. But it all starts with a lens that can't really focus properly to begin with. A Couple more examples of variations on the theme of photographs that are wrong but right. Say you go up to a beautiful city like Vancouver, British Columbia, about 80 miles north of me and um, you want to take cityscape photographs and so you can, you can do that. You can put your umbrella over your camera, maybe you have an assistant, you take beautiful shots of the contemporary architecture there doesn't mean that you should uh, necessarily stop looking when you're in the coffee shop, taking a break and it's pouring rain, go ahead and focus your pocket camera at the raindrops and you know the bu buildings become the backdrop. You know not necessarily a an approach that you would intuitively think if you're out shooting photographs of a building but to me, again this is like a familiar mood. I live in the Pacific Northwest so sitting with a cup of coffee, rain beating against the window, you're thinking about failed relationships, pets that have died and that's what it looks like. That's a really familiar scene for me. So um, I'm not attracted to those moods but it's familiar and I thought this photo kind of captures that. Say you go to the most beautiful place in the world or the most beautiful place according to Jim Krause and that's Death Valley and um, if you've been there when it's not broiling hot like I was, you have the freedom to drive around. Every time you go around a corner, you're like, Unbelievable, totally different. Sand dunes here, canyons there, rocks that are a thousand million years old over there. Completely gorgeous at night, these incredible sunsets because there's dusty air. So one night there was a sandstorm that came in, sun went down into the sandstorm, took pictures of it of course, they're, they're glorious but they're also like everyone else's picture who was in the same campground as I was because that's natural. But what if you go into the men's room at, in the clubhouse on the edge of town after camping for 10 days, you look out the window and you go, oh, I'm a graphic designer, I love this composition. Palm tree conveniently placed in the gap in the window. Well, out comes my camera 
and out goes all the other people that were in the restroom. <laughs> uh, that's what happens. And you take a shot. So it's just like being open to doing things that are not necessarily according to the rules. It's one of my favorite shots in Death Valley. That's just my preference. I'm going to have a few bonus ideas that I'm going to throw in here for you. I carry a purse. Now I'll show it to you. Here's my purse, Timbuktu bag. And the reason I carry it with me is because I want to take it with me at all times. I would say, well, if you don't have it, you can't use it is, is another thing that I keep in mind. I would honestly say that this is my most important habit right here as a graphic designer. Um, more important than anything else I do. Um, more important than any book I've read, more important than any talk by Stefan Muma I've ever listened to, which is saying a lot. Um, this is super important to me because inside my purse is, well, I keep it pretty clean. I'm not, I'm not a super pack rat. Um, I'll start, I'll go counterclockwise starting on the right. I keep whatever book I'm reading. I really like to read books. I get a ton of ideas from books. Um, I'm not reading that one now, right now. That was Bon Ami by Guy Maud Guy de Maupassant, I'm slaughtering the French. What a naughty book. Um, you know, written 200 years ago, I don't know, but um, they were naughty back then. Who knew? FYI. I keep my notepad and my pen, ultra important at all times. Um, I think Scott mentioned I've, I've written about 12 books, and they all started out in a notebook without exception. Maybe, well, they started out in my head, and I'm like, where's my notebook? I write down some notes, it evolves, it becomes a book. Most of my projects are worked on in here. And I write down, it's like an anything goes notebook. I actually have it arranged so when it's this way and I'm starting at this end, it's business related. I flip it open and it's, it's fun related. And I always forget and they get mixed up, but I try to organize it that way. My notebook, super important. And my digital camera. So if I see these kinds of shots that are wrong or right, technically perfect or otherwise, I've got my camera with me at all times. Probably half or more of the shots that I use in my design projects. Um, when they're my shots, they come from situations where I was just out having lunch, looking through a rain spattered window, take a shot. A year or two later, I'm like, I know a, a photo in my collection that'll work perfectly. They were just taken for fun. They were taken because I had my camera with me. So I know a lot of you do this kind of thing, but if you don't, consider it. Here's one more photo project. So I just talked about taking photos that are so terrible, they're great. Um, now we're going to talk about taking photographs that even a photography professor would probably agree with, but in a really easy way. So this one will prove to you that attractive photos can be shot on a budget. Using a pocket digital camera, I mean you can use a better camera, but I'm, I'm just kind of going with the showing how little you can use. You can do this in your living room. You can do it using just the window for light. So. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Here's, here's the layout. And if you can't read all those words, they look pretty good, but I'll, I'll go through these items. Or just buy my book. They're all, it's all covered in there. I use the window for light. So if you got a window, you're good. And if it's daylight, even better. So let the light come in through the window. It will illuminate your subject. Pretty easy. Grab a chair. I like just sticking a piece of black mat board as a backdrop for my, my shots, at least for the shots on this. You can grab a piece of cardboard and put a nice looking shirt over it for a backdrop. Anything, you know, once you see what I'm, I'm doing with the camera, you'll realize it's wide open, but basically establish a sort of backdrop for this project anyway. Grab your camera. I just have my little pocket camera up there. You could use a better one if you wanted. And a tripod, because with window light it can be a little bit dim and you know how if you're trying to handhold something in the close up setting and trying to take a really beautiful shot it can get a little blurry. So use your tripod if you got one and use a stack of books if you don't. And then get a subject. And I'm going to use, if you look really closely, there's a little teeny flower arcing up towards the, the face of the camera. Uh, I chose to use flowers for the book. And it could be anything, toys, objects of interest to you, antiques, anything you want but I chose flowers. So imagine you're in my living room and you see this set up and you're like, well, what's that going to do? Um, looks intriguing. Is it going to take good photographs? You press the shutter and bam, you're like, you're creating art with your camera and you can take some really lovely shots this way. Um, mess around by, so you've got your window over here, your subject right here, put a white piece of paper over here, bounce a little bit of light in, make it look all pretty. You know, this is like your standard um, going for a nice looking photograph technique. 
You could do this for a job where you need to shoot a quick product shot for something. I'm not trying to put photographers out of business but there are times when we as designers um, can and should just kind of shoot our own stuff. Some orchids. Really good project for say a, a weekend morning or something. Uh, I don't watch TV so it gives me time to do stuff, stuff like this so if it's, if it's Sunday morning I'm not watching football I might go well I'm going to wait till later to go outside so I'll do something like this for fun and I'll try out super close up mode my camera, work with the aperture settings, the ISO setting, that's the one that people don't play around with enough I think determines the amount of grain or the amount of sharpness in an image and also shutter speeds and all that but this is the kind of thing that you'll just learn by doing like I'm talking about in a perfect environment for it and voila you end up with frameable usable pieces of photographic art. And these could be really interesting you know if you did like a whole series of favorite objects around your house or you know whatever's meaningful to you. Here's another idea. Make kid stuff. Project number four. Why? Because it's fun. And I put that in all caps because I mean this one is fun. And you'll see what I mean. Makes use of cheap art supplies. Another good thing. It will fully exercise once again your eye for aesthetics and comp composition. Only this time it's not with uh, Adobe Illustrator. It's with crayons. It's with paper mache. It's with paints. Pressure is off with these projects, and it will very likely result in art that you're going to want to display. For instance, paper mache. Like when was the last time you did paper mache? For me. Uh, I did it in kindergarten and the, I did it again about five years ago and now I do it for kind of regularly. It turns out it's super fun just like it was before. I looked up the recipe for paper mache online the first time I was going to do it about five years ago and it's like oh wow there's flour, there's water and, and that's it. You know that's paper mache. Who knew? And if you live in the Pacific Northwest or in a place that's prone to mold, add a little bit of salt to the, the mixture. Um, you, know, you mix it up until it's just the right amount of gooiness. Add some salt because in the, in the Northwest apparently it'll turn into like a, a mold mache as in like the green stuff bowl later on if you're making a bowl like I'm doing here. So I, I learned online that all you, all you need to do to make bowls out of paper mache is blow up a balloon, steady it somehow, I put it in a cup, there's pennies in the cup to keep it from tipping down, tipping around, rip up some paper, you dip it in the goo, you know, and that first dip in the goo is always a little unsettling for me, but you get over it and do that thing where you wipe it, you squeegee it with your fingers, slap it on your balloon, maybe four or five, six layers. Now, I know I'm not going into a lot of detail here, but this is not rocket science we're talking about. Just a reminder of like how easy this stuff is, and it's super fun. I mean, you're working dimensionally here. Yeah, I, I've made three different bowls of three different sizes, and it's just fun to work dimensionally. And a lot of this may or may not relate directly to what I do as a designer but again it's reminding me that art is fun. And then I throw in a final step where the designer comes back into play. The, the art director jumps back into the equation and I paint those suckers like it's like um, what do I want to do? And I don't plan this I just though I'll do polka dots on the inside of one, stripes on one, dots on the other. As pretty uh, colors as I can come up with using whatever I know about color theory or just color instinct. And I use acrylic paints because as a lot of you know they start out being water soluble which is handle handy and when they dry they're waterproof so you got durability and you can wipe these things off. And so that's sitting in my living room now and I like it and it was cost me about ten cents and a, a whole bunch of fun to do. And there's so many variations to this that you can explore. Um, I made a, more bowls, I pulled old sheets of rice paper that had been sitting in my office for a thousand years and I pulled them out and made, made bowls out of it and if I may say so they really look good. They look like museum pieces and you deckle the edges. I mean we're designers, we're supposed to be creative and we can, we can go to town with something like this and it's fun. Um, all the photographs in the book are black and white and most of my photographs in this presentation are black and white. I just thought I'd mention why and it has to do with the book where um, you know I talked to, to Scott and the people at F&W about this and I was, it was in process but I like doing black and white pictures in my books because they don't over influence the reader. It's just so that you won't like subconsciously think oh now my bowls have to be red like I'd much rather people, I need to show something but I don't want to over influence on all points. So that's why they're black and white because I know that y'all can use your imagination and come up with good colors on your own. This, this one is such a favorite of mine. I, my, I specifically remember doing this in kindergarten or first grade and I was crazy about it. So what you do, and you'll know this one, a lot of you will unless somehow you missed out on public school. Um, you take a piece of watercolor paper, smother the whole interior panel with crayons, just thickly draw something so that no, not, not a, any paper is showing up in that center section. You can do swirls, you can do swirling swirls, you can do rectangles like I did. 
anything goes there. Just like fill that thing with crayons thickly. When you're done with that, cover the whole thing over with a wash of India ink. Just obliterate it and let that dry to where it's like chalkboard dry, bone dry. I take a hair dryer from the 1980s, I got it at Value Village and a second hand store for, I don't know if everyone has Value Village or not, but um, dry it really, really good. It's got to be super dry to do this. Then you take something sharp and you know it's coming. Then you draw and every time you draw with this something sharp it drags through the India ink and it reveals what's underneath. I don't know, is it just me or is this like cool as heck? And it, um, this, you're, you're drawing in color when you do this and even if you're just drawing squares with stars on them, which is just the first thing that came to my head um, at the time and besides I, it's not like I can draw a portrait or something that's going to look very good but um, do something like this and it has an extra cool factor as far as I'm concerned and this is a possible backdrop for a design project in the future. Now, and think about it, if you're an artist who can really draw, like if you do have good drawing skills, what about doing a portrait of a friend in this style and you know you can scratch away large areas of the paper, small areas of the paper and I think it would be cool and if I had the right skills I would love to do a whole series of portraits or a whole series of still lifes or landscape drawings all done in this style because that's, that's how crazy about this style I am. Otherwise, just do abstracts like I do, have some fun with it. So again, just a fun art project. I do something like this on a Sunday afternoon and on Monday morning I know I'm extra jazzed about doing my design projects. It's like art equals good, Let, let's get down to business here. I put a lot of this stuff up on my walls. These are all projects from the book, framed. It's amazing what a frame can do for a piece of art, the right frame. And it's much cheaper to make your own art than to buy other people's art. I like that. Here's a bonus, bonus idea. I would say this is uh, the most important bonus idea that I'll be talking about and possibly the most important thing in this whole talk even though it has nothing to do with creativity at all. In fact, it's the, the antithesis of creativity. This is about um, leaving it alone, not doing anything create, creative. I throw this in here for a couple reasons. First of all, um, Doing too much of anything eventually makes you go crazy. We don't want that. That's called burnout. And we need breaks in order to keep our eyes and our brains fresh. You know, just kind of let your thoughts look like that, fluffy white clouds in the deep blue sky. No design thoughts at all. I didn't want to, I, I, I ran through this whole presentation at one point and then I realized, well, some people might think that I'm suggesting that you should be filling every minute of your time with creative projects. I sure don't, not even, not even close. Um, I fill, I fill time with creative projects when I feel like it because these are supposed to be fun and I don't usually have fun when I'm forced to do things so it's like I feel like it, I want to learn a new thing, that's when it happens. Just want to make that maybe a correction in your minds about what I'm talking about here. Um, think about slotting some things into the, the nooks and crannies in your schedule and you know some of this stuff is so fun, really you may have seen stuff already where you go, I want to try that so make some time um, and, and do them. But it's not a mandate. I don't want anyone to feel guilty if they're not doing creative projects with all this spare time. And this led to a little tangential anecdotal story I want to throw in here. It's quick. You know what this is? The new Macintosh. Um, I think it's beautiful. I'm such a Mac fan, it's embarrassing. Um, I think I'm on about my 25th or 26th Macintosh um, since right after the very first model. I got the second model that came out. Anyway, this is, they've come a long way. This thing is only like this big, it's very minimal, I think it's beautiful and it's supposed to be super powerful, good for video and everything, depending who you ask. Of course, PC companies are grumpy about this but I think it's a really amazing machine. Um, so I did my taxes and a miracle happened. I had some spending money left over this year. So I was thinking I should do this. I, my desktop computer is getting a little long in the tooth as they say. It's still good, you know, my Mac desktop computer is still good but this thing's way, way better, especially if I'm doing video which I'm starting to do more of and I figure really I can probably get my work done about 20% faster overall with, it depends on the job of course, um, with a machine like this. So maybe that 20% faster will equate to getting off work an hour earlier every time or maybe getting off work on time once in a while and some more, more time to myself or if nothing else I can get things done quicker and that's always good. So I'm just about to write the check, just about to sign it and then of course you know the, the red devil appears on my shoulder and goes or, hold on there, there's a specialized epic carbon fiber <laughs> 2 by 10 gearing 
SRAM X9 shifters, carbon cranks, you know what I'm talking about, 29 inch wheels, um, a real beauty. And it's on sale for about the same price as the computer. And I'm like, uh, on the other hand, that looks good. So, um, I'm gonna put these in visual scale here for you. That's about what we're talking about. And they cost the same. Um, and they weigh about the same. Did I tell you how light that bike is? It's just incredible. Um, so, it's this thing like, but, the thing I tell myself, I mean I'm a freelancer and I sometimes have to have a, a tough talk with myself about being a grown up. Like what do I do? Do I get the machine that's going to make me work 20% faster or do I add another toy to my garage? I mean I'm thinking well after all my current mountain bike's getting kind of old too. So I thought this over and I just throw this in here just as a way of reminding us like as designers, as professionals, we do have to make the hard choices sometimes and have a sit down talk with ourselves. So after, you know, I did have to shed a few tears and I finally made the decision and I bought myself a specialized Epic 29 inch wheel. <laughs> yeah, right on, thank you, thank you very much. I, I have no buyer's remorse whatsoever and the thing is, it's relevant because I don't know how you're wired but I go crazy if I don't get some exercise once in a while and then my favorite thing to do is a mountain bike ride. Just knowing this is in my garage actually probably makes me work 35% faster because it's like, it's a sunny evening which isn't too common where I live and I'm gonna get this layout done so I can get on my bike. It really turns out to be what the doctor ordered. Sometimes this is the way to go. I will need a new Mac in the next couple of years unless I need another bicycle and that's how it went this time and I'm happy. If I have a favorite, it would probably be this project. So you're, you may be wondering what's a Goldsworthy and you may also know that this is a person's last name, Andy Goldsworthy. He's this guy who is famous for being very resourceful among other things but also being an incredible artist. He goes out into the wild often like to the beach or to a forest, um, to a field, collects stalks of wheat and he'll put them in stunning assemblages, arrangements, compositions, sculptures, whatever. I don't think he has names for them. Uh, sometimes they're so fragile that the wind comes and, and they're gone. Sometimes they're built out of rocks, so they stay there for centuries. If you're interested in this guy, um, there's a documentary called Rivers and Tides, Rivers and Tides, and it's a great documentary. It's not fast paced, it's very quiet, you know, it's not an action movie, but so inspiring. If you haven't seen it, it's just a great, you know, evening movie to watch. I've watched it with my non-artist friends, um, several times, like five times, and I mentioned the non-artist part because they all do really good art even though they're not supposed to be as good as me as a paid professional, but they're good. And we watch this movie together and we all just want to go right out to the forest the next day and start making assemblages out of stuff and work our art skills to the bone. Um, let me show you what I mean. And by the way, here's why we do this, we'll exercise our creative muscles in new ways. This is 3D stuff, this is like you walk around the project type of thing, so it's a whole new feeling. Some of you are into packaging design, so you do work in, in 3D. I don't do much packaging, every once in a while, some signage projects, but 3D is not my usual way of working, so I like this kind of thing. It does incorporate, once again, everything I know about design and composition, and kind of in like a really exaggerated way, you know, something can look good from one angle and you move to a different angle and it doesn't look so good, so you, you work through it that way. We'll exercise your resourcefulness. That's always a good thing. And it'll get you outdoors. So it's like, it's all good news. There's no bad reasons, there's no negative reasons. There's nothing that should keep you from doing this. That's what I'm trying to say. Here's an example. This is a beach in the Pacific Northwest. There's no girls playing volleyball, no guys in speedos throwing frisbees, there's no sand. Well there's sand but it's about six inches below the layer of rocks. This is a typical beach where I live. You don't wear flip flops, you put on thick hiking boots and you head out there. Went with a friend on a really windy, otherwise not very fun day to be outside, it was kind of blustery and it turned fun. We went to this beach and we looked around and I may have been a little bossy because I am an art director. So, and I said, you know, I think we should collect all the rocks that are white with little black specks. And if there's a geologist in the house, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's just like granite with little chips of mica in it. But you know the ones, they're like little Dal Dalmatian patterned rocks. Rounded because they've been sitting there in the tides for a very long time. I would say one out of about every 300 rocks was one of these. So we had to, we had to work. We had to look hard to find them. But the reason I chose them, and it might have been my friend that chose him, I don't, I really don't remember, but um, 
who had this idea, was because all the other rocks were mostly dark. So I thought this would be a nice medium for us. We can make something out of light colored rocks and put it among the dark colored rocks. Here is a stop action movie that describes it better than I can describe it ver verbally. So we went to this beach and collected rocks, sorted them out, then I got bossy and I said well, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna make a line out of these rocks through the dark rocks and we ended up with something like this. I thought well that's pretty cool. I, um, in my biased opinion it was a nice result and something I don't normally do and um, just had to do with working with different textures and resourcefulness and values visually. We leave it behind and others may or may not enjoy it but just the process of doing it was really fun. It's really a good project to do with a friend and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. You can do these things inside also. I spend a few evenings just messing around with my coffee beans in my house. I like coffee an awful lot. Coffee dust, coffee beans, shots of espresso. Takes a lot of patience with these things too to get them to look the way you want them to look. And also, you know, um, you almost forget like I'm also practicing my photography skills when I'm doing these things like uh, depth of field on this shot. I used a lens baby here coincidentally for this one to, to get the part of the shot really blurred. And you know doing a project like this really can lead, say you've got a client, client who does um, certain product development or they have a certain product. What about an arrangement of their project that's really artistic, photographed in an inter interesting way? That's in your brain after you do a project like this. It might come back to you in your professional world. I have always wanted to learn more about movie making but I don't have the equipment, I don't have the talent, I don't have the money and I don't have the friends, I don't know any actors. So it's like well what am I going to do? Um, here's what I do, I make mini movies and the reason being like who doesn't want to be a director? I think it sounds fun to me. But who does have the time to direct a full length motion picture? Well I certainly don't, I don't know about you. And this project will give you an introduction to a new media if you want to do it that way. So what I'm going to show you here, I'll show you an example of one of my mini movies, it's got sound and everything. It's not really a movie though. It's more like um, a sketch made with a video camera. It's um, got, no, got no beginning, no middle, no end. It's got no plot, no character development, nothing of the sort. It's just um, footage that I shot to learn about my digital camera and then I was able to edit, edit it later. This was all shot like after work on a Wednesday night. I had no plans. I just used a little wind up toy for my subject matter and I had no plans to use it for anything else but the next night I looked at the footage and I thought you know about one out of every hundred bits of footage here is kind of cool. I'm just going to stitch it together and add some music. And by the way this thing and a couple other things I've talked about were also in the talk that I did last year with Diana Valentine and I included this one and the next one specifically because I got so much feedback from people afterwards, positive feedback about hey I tried it, look what I did and anyway here is my mini movie and after it's done I'll just tell you one more thing about it. And go.
that's what I'm talking about when I say a mini movie. And you know, for any of you who are interested in technical details, like nothing special is used there. Just a close-up lens, total, you know, running along the beach, trying not to trip over things with my camera held low, no, no rigs, no nothing. Um, super zero budget, and also no intention to even do anything. No intention to show it to an audience, certainly. But there you go. Um, I, like I said, I, I'm interested in movies. I'm interested in video. I don't want to go to filmmaking school. I don't want to have student debt. So I just start doing stuff like this maybe three or four years ago. And last year and the year before, I started doing them for clients. So it's still not on my business card, videographer, but I'm making money making videos. The videos are they're loved by my clients, so someone's liking them. And it's super fun for me. Uh, what a cool break from doing other things that I love, like layouts and books and everything. Um, Video, who knew? But you can learn this stuff if you have an interest in illustration and typography and video. Um, make up your own projects. Keep them finite, fit them into whatever little slots of time you got. And who knows? If nothing else, um, it's fun, for sure. So I talked about this one last year, and once again, just like a lot of, a lot of feedback about it. Make it a date. Um, what I'm talking about here is really simple. Like all these projects you can do on your own, that's totally fine. Or you can grab a friend to do them with, like a husband, a wife, a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a coworker, a good looking coworker. You know, get someone, invite them over, and make art. That's all I'm talking about here. Um, it just ups the fun factor once again. It may lead, after all, to a lifelong relationship of unending love and affection. Or at the very least, it may lead to a singular evening of unforgettable romance, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, this is good date material. Here's an example of like the setup I'm talking about. It's pretty straightforward. Welcome to my kitchen. I'm gonna zoom in on this shelf in the background. It's where I keep art supplies. I keep art supplies there just so that I can never say I don't want to go get all my art supplies. Well, they're already in the kitchen. They're right next to a table. All I, all I got to do is fill a jar with water and I can do paintings. So you're doing an art date, for instance, put all your stuff on the table, invite a friend over, and just make stuff. Um, of course, like think, think in big terms. Um, put on really good music. Uh, make some hors d'oeuvres. You may notice the beverage, a clear beverage with ice in it in the background, which may or may not be a gin and tonic, and just pick up your paints and go for it. You know, whatever goes here. I didn't make these paintings necessarily on art dates, but they're examples of the kinds of things that you can do. I just like to goof around with paints like this on my own because I don't consider myself a painter, but who knows, maybe I can, maybe one day. Just goof around with your paints. The Goldsworthy project that I talked a little while ago, excellent material to do with a friend. I mean, really, you, need, you might need help collecting rocks anyway. Um, bring a friend along for, for the afternoon. Pack a lunch, we did on this day. One of my very favorite things to do for fun, and I accidentally learned things that I need to know for work at the same time, is get a friend during the one week that we call summer in the Northwest, and I grab my camera and my friend, and I'm like, I've always wanted to take one of those pictures of like water coming out, you know, out of the, out of the ocean as someone jumps. And you know, a shot like this, I would guess it took us maybe 50 tries to get it, but ta-da, I got it, and big deal. It's not necessarily gonna be used for a job, maybe, but it was really fun and I learned a lot about shutter speed and about um, you know, getting the horizon line just right and I wanted the, the woman to look like she was really airborne so it meant getting low enough that her knees went above the horizon, otherwise she looks kind of glued to the, to the earth. So learned all that in that afternoon. I have a friend with a gorgeous 1967 Volkswagen and I talked her into just going out with me and my camera to a vacant sort of road near where I live take pictures of her car. At one point, she's bored, she's doing circles in the background, and I sneak a shot where she's reflected in the car window. It's my favorite shot of the day. And um, she didn't even know I was taking it, but it's that kind of thing where, hey, I got my friend, I got my camera, I'm just gonna goof around with it. It's a really fun thing to do with somebody. I'll, you know, use whatever you want for props, and you got an art date. Now when I say art date, of course, I'm not necessarily saying it has to be like a romantic overtones or ulterior motives, but um, do this stuff with your kids, like, um, my son has, is a well photographed person because um, his dad has a lot of cameras. So one day we were thinking, well, how would we do a shot where it's like motion blurred 
an action shot of him skateboarding. I got on a bicycle, rode in front of him, and I just dangled the camera down be behind me because I'm shooting digital, which is so great because I just pressed the shutter button and let it go take about a hundred pictures. I had no idea if, so, if I was getting good shots or not. I used a wide angle lens, so a little bit of forgiving nature as far as aiming the camera goes. And we ended up with some pretty cool shots. He loved them. We had a really great time. It's, and I was learning things about my camera and I learned a technique that I could maybe use someday on a video shoot or a photo shoot, a way of getting shots like this done. And our, our, it took us a while to figure this out too, so lots of learning happened. Um, just kind of snuck all those lessons on myself as I was going. So lastly, um, those, are, those are six of my favorite project ideas. I guess number seven is more of a, um, I'm going to start to wrap this thing up with a few overall thoughts about things, but those six projects I just talked about, they're such favorites of mine, and you know, you all know things you can do along similar lines, but just the idea of learning what you want to learn, having fun with art and all that kind of thing, the point here just being like do and learn, that's all there is to it. That's the point of what all I've been talking about. Aristotle has a really great quote, he has a lot of great qu quotes about a lot of things, but something that's really relevant here, that's not Aristotle, that's my former neighbor Amy doing a great cartwheel. Good backdrop for a quote. Um, what we learn, we learn by doing. Simple as that. Sometimes you just have to hear it from a famous Greek philosopher to really cement it in. But that's all, that's all we're, that there is to it, really. Um, you can learn by reading. You can learn by a lot of different ways. But I think what we really learn, we learn by doing. And I want to throw two questions at you. Um, and then we'll have a few minutes extra for people if they want to ask questions before we take off. But two questions for you. First of all, what do you want to learn? Like, what have you come across this week? What have you heard a speaker talk about? I do the thing, too, where I hear a speaker talk about something really cool, and it goes, I just, my thought is, oh, wow, that's really cool, and it goes right past my ears, I never think about it again. Um, but why not do it ourselves? Why not, like, do some of these things? If you've seen an illustration technique you really love or a video technique that intrigues you that you've seen, carve out a few minutes of time and just start doing stuff. It's really cool how momentum kind of builds on its own once you just start doing things like this. And that's my second question, like how about doing it? There was a person at the last, I did this, a similar talk to this, same material, probably different words coming out of my mouth on Monday, and a guy came up at the end and asked a really good question. He said that his problem was like he wants to do all kinds of things, but you know, you work all day, you put in an eight or 10 hour day, you're tired, you know, we all know this feeling. He's sitting on his couch and he just wants to, eat a steak and potatoes dinner, maybe watch a movie, and go to sleep and call it a day. And that's really hard to overcome. Like, and he's thinking, well, when would I do something like this? You know, um, and on the weekend, he's tired, all that kind of thing. I totally know what he's talking about. I, I completely experienced those things. And I, here's what I do. And it's, it's a one word attempt at a solution anyway. Um, I, I can actually see this word set in like Clarendon bold in front of my eyeballs when I think it, but it's just the word start. Like, um, so you want to do some painting, let's say, or just you want to goof around with um, crayons, but you're like, or I could just sit here and watch TV. It's a tough call, but part of my brain says, come on, just, just do it. You know, you can watch TV anytime, but crayons not, are something special. So I just get, start my feet moving, grab the crayons, and I start. Next thing I know, two hours have gone by and end up with a piece of art and I've learned something new. So maybe try it. That's all I had to offer as far as suggestion to this guy that was asking the question was like, he's like, well, what do I do? And I was like, well, just try starting. I don't think there is anything more magic than that or more, more tricky than that. Um, just begin. So we have about six minutes. I mean, if you need to, to take off, that's just fine. But there is a microphone right there. If anyone wants to pop up and ask a question, we already have one. I'm just gonna, yeah, you don't have much time. Um, so not to like bring this all back to work because it's awesome that you just like, this is what I need to hear is like, just do it, right? Uh -huh, good. And be creative. Um, how does, I'm curious to know, how does all of this help your work? Um, I'm, it helps in all ways. I mean, that sounds like a, a glib answer, but um, even taking this photograph, I could start with every piece that I've done. I learned something about composition. Also, I, it gives my brain a lot of practice at like being resourceful and coming up with ideas on the spot. And every time I do a little abstraction with my paints, I do learn something about color. And I learn what happens when water trickles down a piece of paper, which is something you don't learn in Photoshop. And about color mixing. 
it all applies. I think everything that I do layout wise and illustration wise is, is affected strongly by this stuff. It just makes me feel like more of a creative person. It does make me more creative. Um, I guarantee that my work would be night and day different now if I didn't do stuff like this um, on its own and if for no other reason then I'm eager to do my work because I do associate art with fun due to these projects so it keeps me in the game and it gives me a lot of practice doing things that I wouldn't get otherwise and I can't say direct like correlations too many there's a few but it's more along those lines and it's super important for me. I hope that partially answers what you're saying anyway. Yeah. Anyone else want to take the mic? All right. Thank you.